All right, well, first of all, I just want to thank everyone here for joining uh, my co-panelists alongside. Um, Sharon, Tracy, Helen, I see you are in uh, attendance. And again, really, really thank you for uh, joining us all here today to hear some of the latest and greatest uh, exciting news that are coming around the corner. We are going to be starting this webinar right now with one of our dear friends, uh, absolutely inspirational video and, and testimony as people trickle in. I first developed symptoms of Parkinson's when I was about 38. And during the next decade, I used to suffer with um, was a fatigue and then led to me developing a tremor three years ago when I was 15. That says, was then diagnosed as Parkinson's and it affects the right side of my body. When I was first diagnosed with Parkinson's, one of the things that I first found was on um, YouTube after my diagnosis. Um, and I saw many motivational figures across the world who were living with Parkinson's. That led to me getting involved with Parkinson's UK and also getting involved in some American support groups in the US, especially one group called Invigorate. From there, it led me to um, getting involved with a Charles Key Wall for Parkinson's UK, where 450 pounds, which was three and a half kilometers. That walk transformed me because at that walk I was asked to become a motivational speaker for Parkinson's UK. One of the most interesting things that I've done was to produce also a record for a um, group in America, which then went worldwide with Parkinson's people across the world. Out of that, that has allowed us to, to be able to raise enough money to help support the opening of the Parkinson's team and which is the first dedicated clinic in Africa. One is socialization, getting out there, joining a support group, meeting other people with Parkinson's, meeting your friends, not being balanced. The other things is around nutrition. You have to eat good food because it's considered that part of Parkinson's comes from your stomach as well and what you eat. And the other critical thing is around um, exercise. I have dance, I have done yoga, I've done tai chi, boxing, weights, cycling, walking, table tennis, and I even went back and played at a very good standard of badminton after three years, which I never thought I could do. It's the way that I do through Parkinson's concierge. This December, we've been invited to the Giant Conference. We have been asked to run a complete channel of life with Parkinson's for one day. And we're also running things for the Parkinson's community to ask companies out there to help people with their daily lives. This is the first time that any patient group has been asked to present at this conference. This is a big thing around awareness, and he's also in collaboration with the medical industry as well. When I'm exercising, I feel like my Parkinson's is gone and I can see the benefits of it because I can move a lot freer. The future to me is about meeting people, developing content, working with the researchers, working with the pharmaceutical companies to maybe not develop the cure, but to develop better ways of living with the condition. And the, the biggest message is, is not to be embarrassed of your Parkinson's, continue with your life 
and to work with the condition in the hand. There is definitely hope out there for people. And there's been more hope out there than in the last 50 years. I believe that Parkinson's will become a better condition to live on a day-to-day -day basis. And people should not, with the condition, give up hope. They should seek answers and make sure they are empowered to be able to live the best life they can. <laughs> So that was a lovely inspirational video from our dear friend, Richard Underwood, who's recently been inducted as our first board of directors and second. Video was going off. Um, yeah. And Anthony, uh, can I just mention uh, yeah. very quickly, some people are having trouble getting in. Let me, let, me get this. let me let me send you the latest and greatest uh, meeting ID and passcode. And if you can circulate that around, um, they're probably using the previous one. So I'm going to send this to everyone in the panelists. So that's it right there, the webinar ID and the passcode. But, um, you know, the link should be accessible. I, I they, you... they need the new link. Yep, the new they're link. using the old link, send them the new one. Okay, I'm going to send it out here within the panel. Don't give them the webinar and passcode, just the yes. new link. Just the new link, okay. So the, the one that we promoted on Facebook is the same link? We promoted two different links. So just send them the new okay. link, the one that's the good one. The, one. the one that I promote is fine. We don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, Jose, it's in the Zoom chat, and I'll also send it to you on Messenger. No, but the one, the one that we promoted in Facebook, the one that you gave me we, for... We promoted two separate links. Okay, the one that you gave me for Facebook, it's good. It's yeah, we promoted me. two separate links on Facebook. The first one right. was incorrect, so... Okay, well, folks are trickling in. Hello, William. Thank you for joining. We have Tan, Tom, Tracy, William, yeah, Rosie, okay. Sharon. I would say, as you know, as we're starting off this webinar, uh, wherever you are in the world, maybe in the in the chat, if you'd like to send to everyone in the panelists and the attendees, just mention where you are joining from the world. We already have quite an international presence. So how about we start off with uh, round robin introductions? Um, we, can, we can start off with either Tina or Richard. I know Richard is working in the background, sending out some details. So Tina, would you like to go first? So one second, I've just got some. So I've, I was gotta, trying to answer a couple of emails, hold on a second, or text messages about that's People okay. who are Maybe. trying to join. <laughs> How about Andreas? Would you like to introduce yourself first? All right. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the senior AI engineer at Ageless. Um, so I helped Tony develop different um, apps for motion tracking, for helping out with different exercise regimens, um, doing some hand tracking to help potentially help uh, doctors do something like the UPDRS3 to do like Parkinson classification and monitoring over like remotely uh, using telemedicine. Um, yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see how far we can get. Thank you, Andreas. Andreas is one of our best engineers, but he's also very, very humble. So I'm going to share some more details about Andreas as well. Um, 
Andreas right now is currently in San Francisco and he splits his time between uh, my company, Ageless AI. And uh, he's also working on site at Stanford Sleep Lab. He's a very, very busy individual. He's completing his PhD from one of the leading universities, DTU, Denmark Technical University. So towards the end of this year, around January, he'll be returning to Denmark to complete uh, his studies over there. Um, some interesting facts is that he's done some uh, fascinating research uh, related to sleep, sleep medicine, sleep apnea, as well as um, uh, Parkinson's and how uh, it's correlated with, with sleep. As we all know, sleep is very, very important for all, all humans. <laughs> That was my cat dog <laughs> saying hi. Every time he, he hears my voice, he gets excited. <laughs> so we got, might get used, might have to get used to that. Um, Richard, it looks like you're you're communicating just directly to me on the chat. Um, so you know, in the Zoom chat, uh, make sure that um, now I'm not sure who the other uh, Richard Underwood has joined. Maybe you have sent your your link, Richard, to. Um, this individual. Um, there is a public link that we're supposed to share. The panelists have their own unique links um, that they receive, but that, that's quite all right. You know, this is one of our first, uh, you know, webinars that we're holding, so a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, but yeah, back to Andreas. Um, he has very, very fascinating um, leading research that has been published uh, in journals such as IEEE. Um, some of his research can also be found in um, the National Institute of Health's um, National Library of Medicine as well. So if anyone is interested, please ping into the chat and either Andreas or myself will send you some of his uh, white papers and research that uh, you're more than welcome to go through. So Andreas, thank you for being part of this team. And, and also thank you for you know carving out some time on, on a Saturday morning here. Thank you, Jamie. Next up, uh, we would like um, Tina to introduce herself, or Sharina. Sharina, if you'd like to introduce yourself. All right. I am a systems neuroscientist, and I've studied neural circuits and brain rhythms for my dissertation at the University of Michigan. I'm co-founder and chief scientific officer of an automotive software startup in computer vision called Info. And we've partnered with some bigger companies for some projects such as Denso AI and Volvo Cars. And now I get to combine some elements of these two worlds as our neuroscience UX UI advisor at Ageless AI. Thank you so much, Sharina. Um, so she just recently completed her PhD from uh, University of Michigan, and we're really, really happy uh, to have her uh, advising uh, myself and the team. Um, she's done some fascinating work with robotics, as well as sensory development and sensory motor uh, development. And even in her labs at University of Michigan, um, if you'd like to elaborate more with what you've done with um, Parkinson's and, and other uh, neurological conditions. Sure. I've worked in a Parkinson's lab for one of my research rotations where I was the person who set up a lot of the behavioral systems. So making boxes of operant conditioning so that we could see, okay, what happens when we manipulate different parts of the dopamine system, different dopamine receptors with it using light. So we did some optogenetics experiments and saw how that affected some fine motor movement behaviors, tracking with computer vision. Thank you so much, Sharina, for your introduction. Next up, we have, Tina, are you ready? I am, I just sent you a note in the chat. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Tina Baylock. I'm the, um, Chief Operating Officer of Ageless AI. I'm um, joining you this morning for the first time. So good to meet everyone. Um, so a little bit about me really quickly. Um, I've joined the team and um, really excited to be learning along with you about some of our latest um, updates as Tony speaks today. Um, I, uh, I come to the team with uh, 
25 plus years in marketing, launching products, working with sales teams and organizations across Silicon Valley here in California in the US. Um, uh, just a long, a long history of, of working with small and large organizations to help them sell and launch their products and some very iconic brands. Tony likes to talk about the iPad launch at Apple and the Pixel launch, which is a phone that Google makes. Um, but um, I'm just a self-professed geek. I love technology and I love solving problems and um, helping markets grow. So we're really looking forward to making some really um, groundbreaking changes in healthcare and helping to really um, make some changes to the Parkinson's community. So glad to be here today. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, we're I know I'm incredibly happy and honored to have Tina be part of this team. One, she brings nearly three decades of experience um, across the board and she's able to leverage some of her prior experience to uh, contribute and take Ageless AI to the next level. Uh, she's been helping me uh, get my act together, clean up my pitch, um, make sure I do things in a certain manner. Um, and again, you know, what we're doing and, and solving in, in a great need of this world, especially in a, in a neurological condition that hasn't seen much attention, um, it's complicated. It's extremely, extremely complicated. And so Tina has, you know, uh, ever since she's joined, she's really taken a good, strong understanding of what it takes to get this product out there into the real world um, as well as stress the key points of what we're delivering and developing. And like I mentioned, this is complicated. This is not easy to do. Uh, so I'm really, really grateful to have Tina um, alongside me as our COO. And just so you folks are aware, um, Tina and I work out of this office until we hours of the night. We come in here very, very early. And I know the last few days, we probably were working until 10, 11, even 12 midnight sometimes. <laughs> so speaking of sleep, I know Andreas doesn't like to hear the sound of that. And I even bugged Andreas this morning to join this webinar. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of sacrifice the team is doing. And we also have to make sure we look after our own health so uh, we can deliver you know, the technology that we'll be sharing with you all shortly. I would say we cover up the bags under our eyes very well. <laughs> <laughs> but hey it's you know in order to make an impact on the world that's what you have to do you have to sacrifice you have to put yourself out there and um as as the work continues to spread um you know it, it's, it's all going to be this moment in time so um i think this is priceless even even if we're aging a little bit even though we're called ageless ai <laughs> So that said, um, I'd like Jose to introduce himself. We wouldn't be here without Jose. He is the organizer, and I'm sure many of you who are in attendance uh, know Jose very, very well. Um, he's a little disappointed in the new different format that I'm doing because we're going away from his family ecosystem and intimate setting that he normally has uh, every Saturday. So for, the, for those of you who don't know, uh, Jose holds uh, these sessions through his various Facebook channels and groups uh, every Saturday, and he uh, asks uh, guests to come on board and uh, present on various topics. And, and I'll let uh, Jose uh, share more about what he's done in the past, uh, what he does for the Parkinson's community. And um, he's actually um, retiring tomorrow. So big congratulations to Jose. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Julio. Uh, actually, I have a Parkinson's disease. I've been fighting with Parkinson for 16 years already. Probably more. Probably don't is that. Can you agree with me that if you look back in time, you realize the Parkinson's right you have when you have maybe like 16, 17 years old. As Tony say, my goal is looking for around the world people like me because I want to see how people look like with Parkinson's. 
I don't want to read in internet. I don't want to see Dr. Lopini. I want to see how people look with Parkinson. And I want to show to the world how people, how, how, how we are. We are normal. So every Saturday we meet from my house, my apartment. So you want to see my dog, my son jumping everywhere. So, and then uh, that's my, my primary goal. And we've had participation in a lot of different groups, a lot of different activities, other groups in Germany, in, in, especially in Tennessee, in Australia. Um, I met Tony, actually Tony lived two hours away from my house, we didn't know, we we're so, so close. And then um, right now we have, um, we are working in a, in a project that we call Tuesday Step by Step. And I want to invite you guys, um, every Tuesday, I want you guys to count your step. Every Tuesday. And I went to send me a messenger, how many steps you did in that day. Everybody needs to do that day. You cannot be the day standing, you see, so everybody move, or the bathroom, or the, the bar, you go to work. My goal is one million steps in one day. Last Tuesday, we did uh, 567 steps in one day. We only 89 participants. We are more than 500 around the world. So I want to invite you guys this Tuesday, please, can you step, send me a messenger by Tony, by Tony. We need one million steps in one day. Why? Because we want to show people that we can move. And we have to move. We cannot be here sit all the time. That's the worst thing that we can do, a step and, and you see all the time. The more he impacted, but the more um, touched me a lot was a comment for a lady from, from Australia, sorry, from Mexico. And she said that she'd been in bed for many years without move at all. And after she saw the message, she asked the, the family, right, helping her move, get out of the bed. She do two steps. That's just step for me was more than one, two million steps. That's the goal. So anyway, I do a lot of activities. Uh, basically, we meet every Saturday and this is totally different for me. I, I was Tony telling the, it's kind of made me out of my, my, my comfort zone. Um, usually we meet every, every Saturday, you are invited to come over all the time uh, as a guest. Uh, we have a speaker, we're looking for a speaker, uh, people with a professional, people not professional. We're looking for testimonies. I, my goal is test when my well, people with Parkinson come out to the closet, I can say that, come out to the camera, right? And then tell us how they live. So we have mothers, single mother, we have we got single father, we have people within Australia. We, we, we have, you have no idea how many amazing uh, stories we find with we say people with Parkinson. We're really, 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 we have a lot of information to share. And then uh, we are normal people. We are not condemned to a disease. We, are, we have a diagnosis. So Parkinson is terrible. Parkinson, I think, one of the most painful disease in the world. And the disease. So, and then, by the way, Parkinson moved me to the, not talking about, also a little about Parkinson. I call neuroliga disease. So in my group, we have Parkinson, we have dystonia, uh, Alzheimer, dementia. We have everybody involved in the group. Uh, one thing that I have, I like to talk a lot. So Tony needs to stop me because I need talking, 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 talking. So he needs to stop me. Anyway, so if you want to, don't forget Tuesday, please. I can't with you guys. I can't with you this Tuesday. We need one million steps in one day to show to the poor that we can move to our wedding for partners. Thank you, Tony. Oh, thank you, Jose. Thank you for uh, having me be a part of this be a part of uh, the awareness you're trying to bring uh, throughout the whole world. And uh, we see you making a huge impact and please, please keep it up. None of this would be able possible uh, without, without people like yourself with a personal experience. Um, and there has to be more patient advocates like you. And we can't wait to see you soon. Tina and I are gonna come visit you in Sacramento very soon. That said, I'm gonna hand off the mic to my dear father, uh, Johnson. He's gonna introduce himself as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Johnson, Tony's dad. I'm living in New York, New Hyde Park. I got the time, the park, shut the park in 2013. Right now, 
you know i'm still doing all the work i'm still okay still going on the business what is your business dad i drive the limousine you drive those big limousines not the big limousine the small car the oh, but okay. you know four door sedan okay but big 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 people Big, big people meaning what? Billionaires? Billionaires. <laughs> so uh, there, there's my cat. Hey, Caesar, say hi. Say hey, hey, Dad, show everyone our, our cat dog, Caesar. So for folks who aren't aware, um, I live in California. I used to live in New York for over 25 years. Uh, my dear mom and dad are still residing in New York and I can't wait to see them shortly. I'm flying in for, for Thanksgiving. So see you soon, Dad. Thank you, Tony. I love you. And, and love you you're, you're always my source of inspiration. And, um, you know, I would always remember growing up as a small kid, you know, the sacrifice my father would do, put on his suit and tie early in the morning. He would get up sometimes four, five, six in the morning, and he would be out the door. And sometimes he would only come about. Uh, very late in the evening, 8, 9, 10, 11 p.m. Um, you know, his, his work demands him a lot. Um, his clients have very high expectations of himself, and um, he has to have a certain poise and confidence and, and knowledge around the streets of New York City, Manhattan. Um, it takes a lot to do what he's doing. Um, a lot of sacrifice to do what he's done, especially, you know, providing for uh, our family, my mother, my, my, myself and my brother. Um, he's put us through amazing schools. Um, he's always provided for us, made sure we have a roof over our head um, and, you know, nice meal for us to have. And we're very, very grateful. Um, just the past few weeks, I, I flew back in from London, uh, where I got to catch up with my younger brother. And, and right now, my dad is showing Caesar. So if you see my dad's, uh, I'm going to pin it right now. That is our good old boy, Caesar, buddy. Hey, Caesar. He knows his name, Caesar. And he gets excited whenever I, I do FaceTime because he recognizes my voice. He's my little baby. He is my little baby. Oh, is this still pinned on me? Let me see. So shall I introduce myself? Absolutely. Let me just get rid of it. <laughs> um, Otherwise, I'll feel a bit left out. Oh, no, no, of course, of course. Now, now, it's, <laughs> your, now it's your turn to shine, Richard. All, the floor is all yours. Yeah, so my name is uh, Richard Underwood. So I'm known to people on Jose's group as, uh, as Richard. Um, I'm also known as the rickety warrior. So I've most likely had parking since I was 38 and I'm now 57. Um, I've just recently discovered after four years of trying that my the, the medication has very little effect on me at all. Um, so I'm having to now revert back to a different type of plan for my Parkinson's. So who, who have I known on the call? So I've had um, I've actually had breakfast in New York with um, uh, Anthony's mum and dad via Zoom one day. So um, which was, so I've met Anthony's dad. I've met Serena with all of her technology and abilities that she's got. And uh, I met um, Anthony, who contacted me on Zoom one day and said, how do you fancy coming on board and helping us? Yeah, what he didn't tell me was that he wakes up at three in the morning and sends me messages. And I have to keep saying to him to go back to bed. So what is my position? Hey, hey, um, I'm, pulling a, I'm pulling a Richard. You, you do the same thing. You're always up two, three, four in the morning, UK time. Yeah, I'm like, but, but I've got the control of the camera and the mic at the moment. <laughs> so um, so I've, I now operate uh, very recently. I've got a position within the company as a board member, as director of, of communities. So I will be coming around the communities in time and um, asking people for various favors and keeping people informed. Some of the stuff that um, Asia's AI are developing are absolutely mind blowing. And, um, and, other, and other technologies that um, are, are occurring across the, um, 
sort of Parkinson's world, especially in the US. So what um, Anthony is basically doing is he's trying to bring early diagnosis of the condition much more forward. I suspect people in the community are well aware that you can wait for a year, two years, a number of months to get a diagnosis. So it's taken me four years to get mine. And uh, but Anthony's systems will be efficient, cost effective, and will allow people to be diagnosed with Parkinson's much quicker, which is again the key to living a better life. So without saying sort of too much, um, I can only be as good as I am because of the wife that I have as well. So Helen's sitting in another room monitoring this whole affair and answering people's questions that come up and any difficulties that people are having getting in. So that's me. So back to Tony. Thank you, Richard. Um, really, really grateful to uh, have met Richard during um, the global shutdown. Uh, we connected over Twitter and we just hit it off. We, we, we just connected like that. We were buddy buddies since day one. And um, the amount that Richard has done, I just can't put into words, um, not just for our company, but for the entire glo global Parkinson's community. Um, and, you know, it's really, when it comes to making an impact, it takes a number of stakeholders, it takes a number of people involved, uh, it takes different specialties and experience to really uh, deliver, find the right message and, um, and bring things to the market, introduce things to the market. And at the same time, raise awareness. And, you know, Richard Underwood, as he mentioned, uh, he goes by Ricky Warrior. And for folks who joined the call earlier um, at the start, we had shared a very inspirational uh, video by him. Um, Richard, if you, you know, want to share that uh, link to you, uh, to, to the folks on the chat, uh, by all means, that way, you know, the folks who missed it um, um, can, can see it. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to share some awesome highlights from our first board meeting. So I just came back from a lovely trip in London. Um, oh, oh, there he is. Look at this rock star right here. So that's, that's Richard right here um, and myself. And this was our very, very first board of directors meeting uh, we had in central London. So it was lovely to see Richard in the flesh, uh, in person, um, and and we went we went quite around around town. This is a London Eye, and you know for those of you who don't know Richard, Richard is brings a wealth of knowledge and information, not only with Parkinson's but just in general. He's one of the brightest individuals around, and we did this really cool. Um, tour on the River Thames. And uh, as we were doing the tour with his lovely wife, Helen, uh, he would just share so much uh, historical information and context for me. This is the Tower Bridge. Say hi, Helen. <laughs> Mr. Rockstar Rickety Warrior over here. Gonna be jumping around Ozzy Osbourne later tonight. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure many of you are on the call here, especially if you've joined um, Jose's and, and Richard's rooms in the past, um, you know, the behind of the scenes operation behind the Rockstar and Rickety Warrior is Helen. Um, Helen is uh, in, in attendance here today, and and um, this is a power power couple right here. Um, it's amazing what they do together, and and all the strengths that they bring to the table. And um, Helen is also really engaged with with our team right now. And we've had a number of conversations, especially in the last couple of weeks since I came back from uh, the UK. Helen is working closely with our team, working closely with Tina, and they'll be strategizing. Uh, from PR, marketing, and media. Um, so really, it's a real, real pleasure to have met you uh, in the UK. 
and um, excited to see you again. I, sh I, I should be presenting next year in London um, at one of the conferences at the Longevity Leaders World Congress. So we'll see if you can get some uh, invites and tickets for, for you to join us. I'm just gonna wrap this up with a couple more um, highlights from our trip. So it was a really, really lovely time. Before I went to the UK, I told everyone that I'm a lucky person and that I'm gonna bring the California sunshine. And that's exactly what I did. For those two weeks straight, um, there was not a trickle of rain until the morning I was leaving. So again, thank you, Richard and Helen, for, for all that you've done. Um, we wouldn't be here without you. And again, in order to make the impact uh, that we need, it, it takes a lot of stakeholders with, with a breadth of knowledge. That said, I do see another guest or panelist up here, Jane Cullen. Um, would you like to briefly introduce yourself as well? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for letting me um, listen in on this. Um, Richard invited me. I know Jose. Hi, Jose. And um, hi, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm an exercise specialist. I've uh, been teaching for years, but I specialize in teaching people with Parkinson's and um, other neurological conditions. Um, I'm also an author because of all the wonderful people I've met with living with Parkinson's. I decided to write a novel about a man diagnosed with Parkinson's and um, yeah, to raise awareness mostly and to raise money, gave all the money away. Um, and just a little bit about that. I um, Publishers didn't want to know about it because they said no one would want to read about a man with Parkinson's and I disagreed. So I self-published and it sold all over the world. So because Parkinson's is all over the world. So that was really, really great. If you want to have a look on Kindle, it's called Say That Again. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I really, I'm, I've been embraced by the Parkinson's world, um, which is brilliant because of the novel. And really, what I get involved in stuff like this and listen, because I, I want to help the people I teach as much as I can with as much knowledge as I can and things change all the time um, and are ongoing, obviously. Um, I've met Richard through a um, mutual friend, um, which is great. And um, I always have to put aside about two hours when Richard's gonna FaceTime me because um, he's got such a lot to say. <laughs> True enough. And uh, no, but it's wonderful. And I, um, as I say, I've been embraced by the Parkinson's world and um, I've met some of the most wonderful people who have enriched my life and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. So I'm really glad that I decided to uh, write a novel about Parkinson's as well. So, yeah, so that's me. And I, I teach people every week, um, courageous people battling their condition. Uh, with as much bravery as they can they never give in um, quite literally they never give in um, and I just find it um, humbling really to um, to teach them so and I love to listen to anything like this because I like to know what's going on um, and um, if you come over to London again Anthony I'm in London so um, please let's have a cup of coffee with Richard and his lovely wife and um, it'd be great to see you Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I'll certainly, thank you, Jane. I'll, I'll certainly take you up on that offer. And this is the first time I believe we're, we're meeting each other and thank you for joining. Um, unfortunately, Richard was a bad boy and didn't introduce me to you this past time. So I'm gonna blame it on Richard. <laughs> Let's blame everything on Richard. <laughs> oh, Why the, not? Fingers go, the fingers go that way. <laughs> thank you. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to put you. I'm not going to talk to you for a week as a punishment. That, that's good. Jane, that, that means that means more free time and more work that can be done. <laughs> I'm only so, two. So, Anthony, let me ask you a question. By all um, means, just, so, don't, just don't throw me under the bus. So, so why did you start up Ageless? Very good question. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the 
there's my father who also again he my father's a little shy over here and as as he was introducing himself um you can see that you know he has a lot of excitement that he's trying to contain but with his parkinson's condition um you know you can notice that uh, he, he might shake the camera quite a bit plus he's dialing and um joining via his iphone um so why did i start ageless ai when my father was first diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, back in 2013. I was in the middle of my college career. I was a young, young boy. And quite frankly, when his diagnosis happened, that was the first time I ever heard the term Parkinson's. This was not a disease that I was familiar with. Um, it was a brand new word and term that came to light for me. When I did my initial research, I found out that it was a neurological condition, a brain disease, and it frightened me. Um, again, I was in the middle of my college career. I didn't know much. I, I was in my own little bubble, first of all. So uh, learning more about the condition, um, doing my initial research at that time, uh, but I put it on the back burner. But when I started my career in technology, I started my career in Wall Street, and then I moved to Silicon Valley in 2018, um, I always knew that I wanted to make an impact one way or another. So being immersed in Silicon Valley, where you have some of the brightest individuals, uh, especially in science and technology, um, between some of these universities uh, as Stanford and UC Berkeley, I really exposed myself to the right people. Um, I spent time as a research assistant uh, at Stanford Psychology. And I was also at Donner Lab at UC Berkeley. And that's where some of the core modules and uh, fundamental analysis for Ageless AI started. Now, at that time, I didn't know that I wanted to start, you know, this medical technology company or a diagnostics company. Um, it was just really for myself because I was passionate because of my personal relationship with my father. And um, I want to see what I could do. And research was the only thing that I could do at that period of time. So, you know, at UC Berkeley, I was with a physician led group um, with some business uh, students from Haas Business School engineers, um, biomedical students, physicians, um, medical pre-med pre students, um, AI engineers, and myself. And by accident, I was building the initial uh, version of some of our core technology. Um, and I didn't know it would evolve into something like this. So, all of that really started back in 2019. And when we were developing the technology, we were initially developing for stroke rehabilitation. And in the back of my head, I always told myself, I wonder what I could do for my father and all the millions of people suffering around the world with Parkinson's. Um, and then before you know it, um, the global shutdown happened from COVID. And we had really hot technology. It was entire remote, remote-based applications. Um, the entire healthcare system within the states and global, globally changed incredibly fast. Um, just how you know we're all in this session right now. Um, many people wouldn't be connected globally right now, and you can see in the chat. You know, as you circle through, cycle through the chat group, people are joining this call right now with over 20 participants from all over the world. I mean, pre-COVID, that was almost unheard of. All right, so this whole idea of being in touch with remote, uh, you know, remotely uh, was brown was was game changing. And so our technology is also using a lot of video-based assessments. Uh, especially in real time. And the AI we've developed can be deployed in the comfort of your home. 
And so when I've connected with Richard and, and many of you, uh, I see a lot of familiar names in the audience from Jacob Kidney to Glenn, to May Evers, May's calling in from uh, Germany, uh, one of our dear advisors, Tan Rasab. Um, you know, folks, folks are joining from all over the world. And when, when I've connected with individuals uh, from all over the world, especially with the people of Parkinson's, there was a common theme. Everyone was struggling with the condition. The neurologists seemed to make half-fast decisions. And quite frankly, it's not their fault. It's a, it's a systemic problem. Parkinson's is the fastest growing brain disease in the world. And it's outpacing the clinicians that are coming out of medical schools. It's outpacing the specialists that are being trained. And this is the next pandemic in the waiting, unless some, someone does something about it. We've seen what COVID-19 has done to the world. Just imagine what Parkinson's will do to the world. Earlier this year, Richard, myself, and I'm sure many of you, um, we all did the red letter effort. We all pitched in on our part um, to raise awareness to the White House administration and Joe Biden. And look at what an impact we did. Almost 15 thousand red letters have been sent to Joe Biden and the White House administration. And I believe it was last month or in August, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, banned one of the three chemicals we all outlined, chloroporophis. This one chemical is found in herbicides and pesticides and has may be a contributing factor in the development of the disease. So we're all making an impact on various fronts and we have to continue making an impact and continue raising awareness. And I was really fortunate to have, again, met Richard and Helen um, just a couple of weeks ago in United Kingdom. We met with, uh, with an amazing individual, uh, Gary Shaughnessy. Gary Shaughnessy, is a chair of Parkinson's UK. Uh, he suffers from Parkinson's himself. And with my own two eyeballs, I even saw him set the world record. Him and his pal, Adam, for 24 hours, they did, they set the world record for the longest duration of a three-legged challenge. For 24 hours, nonstop, this, amazing and inspirational individual, Gary and his friend, Adam, they did 117 kilometers, which is 73 miles. I'm a healthy individual. I don't even think I could do 20 miles, just to be frank and honest. The weekend before that, Gary did the London Marathon with his two boys, and his team from Parkinson's UK. Not only that, he's also the chair of Z Zurich uh, Foundation and the life science side. So I've connected with Gary a few times and I've donated for the cause and we love what Gary is doing because again, it's individuals like him. It's individuals like Rick D. Warrior, AKA Richard Underwood. It's, it's individuals like Alex Flynn, people like Matt Eagles, who are suffering from this horrible, horrible condition and raising awareness. So I hope I answered your question, Richard. <laughs> why, why, why uh, I'm building Ageless AI, and, and you're you're part of uh, front and center, and like I said, you're you're part of the team, and you're a board of director. You're you're one of my bosses. I have to report to. Mm -hmm. So so what? Um... Um, Anthony hasn't mentioned is that at this present time, um, a friend of ours, 
called Alex Flynn, who I will be trying to get onto Jose's group, hopefully in the new year. He's currently just done 3,000 metres and he's on his way up to the summit of Everest. So he's just approaching base camp at the moment. And this guy has Parkinson's. And he's also got a trolley being taken up with all his medication on board. Unfortunately, Anthony nearly ruined the whole expedition because the, the, the last night when he was after trying to um, get some decent sleep, Anthony forgot where he was in the world and phoned him at three o'clock in the morning. So I put an embargo on um, Alex's phone just in case he's up at the summit, put the flag down. And he he still him. answered my text moments ago. <laughs> yeah. So so currently we have somebody with Parkinson's for a number of years. We are trying to climb Mount Everest. So I'm going to move Anthony on. And um, I because some of the things that Anthony is working with, with Ageless, is very, very, very well scientific. Star Trek, if you're into that, this is what it seems to be leading to, an early detection. Um, so I'm not the scientist on here, and I'm certainly not the, the computer programmer. So I'm going to ask Anthony and his guys to explain and to show what they're doing, and also to explain the, and the applications that they're making to help people um, with their Parkinson's. So I'm going to hand it back to Anthony to take over and to show people what he's actually doing. So if you don't like Terminator, this is the point where you move on to another program. So Anthony will now show somebody, I hope, with some green eyes. And then he can explain what it's all, all about and how he does it. Before we get to the green eyed alien looking individual uh, who's currently based in Denmark, he was over here in the Bay Area. and. Um, splitting his time between Ageless AI and, and Stanford uh, Healthcare. Um, we have a number of different products uh, in development. And uh, before I get to some of the early detection uh, AI, I, I'd like to showcase um, the, and by the way, I'll, I'll be, um, you know, presenting. So if folks are messaging me directly, try to message with the panelists, maybe someone uh, alongside me like Tina or Richard might be able to answer. I see something that came in from Sharina. Um, so, so please try to uh, answer either uh, ask directly with everyone uh, in the group or, or to all the panelists. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, I have sent out uh, a link to our demo application, at least our first version of the MVP. This is something that we'd like to bring into market. And again, I started developing this by accident. Uh, it was more a passion. And when we've been connecting with people from all over the world, like yourself, suffering from this horrible condition, there's been this common theme, right? One of which is that you never get time with your neurologist. Depending where you are in the world, uh, like Richard uh, in Basingstoke, a rural part of UK, when he was first diagnosed, the NH system, the UK healthcare system, only allocated 40 minutes out of the entire calendar year for Richard. That's just really, really sad. My father, who's based in New York, is one of the luckier ones. Um, he, he was only allocated about three to four visits out of the entire calendar year. And earlier this year, I went into the clinic with him and I was shocked to see that we only got 25 minutes with the neurologist. And it was through some of these personal experiences, hearing ex um, testimonials from Richard, from Jose, uh, and many of you listening in here today, we've, we've definitely chatted in the past. Um, I was compelled to make a difference. So if you see my screen, I'm sharing uh, what we call the Motion Doc Dashboard. This is an application that will be rolled out to healthcare facilities where your movement disorder specialist or your neurologist will have access to. Because of data privacy and patient privacy and 
you know, HIPAA regulation, especially within the states, I can't really show you a real patient profile. So I've set up this demo to highlight someone like, like my father. I've placed my own personal name and I've said I'm a Parkinson's warrior. Um, so the neurologist can see how old the individual is, uh, if the individual is male or female, and when the individual was first diagnosed and, and where they're located. One of the other problems when it comes to uh, debilitating, debilitating disease like Parkinson's is having proper communication flow between your care partners. And with some of these brain diseases and movement disorders, you have a multi-care unit team. So how does the neurologist maintain and be on the same page with the physical therapist? We've, we've also solved that. So if I'm, I'm you know, my father's neurologist or if I'm Richard's neurologist and that physical therapist isn't in-house at, you know, let's say uh, University College of London or um, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. The physical therapist might be located elsewhere in a different ecosystem. How do you maintain that communication layer? We've solved that within this dashboard application. So I can quickly see ahead maybe the next day or the next week, what the physical therapist has outlined, how long these knee exercises might be, uh, what he or she may have outlined for some of these advanced exercises or, or recommended electrical stimulation, perhaps. We've also solved uh, another big problem within healthcare in general is the lack of data integration. Uh, many of you don't even have access to your own data, which is what we give you on your mobile application and, and the technology. So for example, if someone had a recent MRI study scan or a PT scan, um, the physician or the neurologist can quickly pull that up and, and have a look at it to see what's going on. See, we're changing the game by empowering the clinician with multiple tools so they can be more efficient and we can reduce um, the overhead within the healthcare system. So when Richard or my father goes into a clinic, that 20, 30 minutes that they have, that precious moment in time, you make sure that you are really sharing your problems and not answering questions to see where you are uh, with this debilitating condition. Um, we've also, we continue to integrate a number of wearable technologies from your smart watches to your smart rings. And you know, for folks who missed um, some of the earlier introductions, Andreas Brinkier is on the call here. He's one of our panelists and he's the senior AI and machine learning engineer. And he splits his time between Ageless AI and Stanford Sleep Lab. Uh, he's one of the leading uh, experts when it comes to sleep medicine. And, and his work and research is published in IEEE and NIH's National Library of Medicine. If you want to know the links, just ask, and I'm sure Andreas will share uh, those links to the group. So sleep, as we all know, is very important when it comes to one's health especially with some of these brain diseases. So the clinician, through the collection of data from the smart wearables, they can see when the individual has gone through deep sleep, REM and non-REM cycles. If there's any disruption in sleep, to find correlating patterns of why um, that person might be affected for whatever reason. Now, one of our impressive technologies that I built a couple of years ago and I integrated is this motion tracking, right? So for folks who are aware, when a person goes into a clinic, the clinician or the neurologist does a visual observation and 
this is based on an international scale called the UPDRS. So they have their notepad or on their computer, they'll ask a series of questions, plus do a visual diagnosis. And, you know, from Richard's experience and my father's experience, I've heard a number of issues that come with this. And I'm sure right after this, uh, Richard could share a personal story. So we've automated a lot of this um, UPDRS scale using AI diagnostics. One, to bring efficiency, uh, to bring accuracy, and reduce, again, the overall burden within the healthcare system. Uh, Richard, would you like to share one of your recent experiences when you went into UCL, uh, University of College of London, where you went for your L-DOPA challenge day and how long the report came and even when you were in that day, how long did you spend there and even the inconsistencies you've seen with some of these specialists? Yeah, so, so over the last um, four years, I have been um, integrated into the local NHS system. Um, that has led me to basically receiving, in my opinion, very little support or general care. So I've moved up to University College London, but even there, it's taken nearly 10 months to get a result. So five months ago or four months ago, I sapped a dopamine challenge. And uh, so my, my case, like everyone's on here, is slightly different. And that is, you know, the medication has no effect on me. So I had to come off of all the medications. I was put onto the highest amount they can give a human being. So I started to suffer before I went up there with involuntary movements. So I'd go left and my, and my right leg would go right. So I'd end up looking drunk and uh, staggering down the street if I could walk hard in. So I turned up on the actual day to give you an idea. And um, I could walk very well in the morning because I hadn't taken any medication. So I've been saying for four years that when I take the medication, um, it's like you're giving me Parkinson's. So they were very impressed in the morning and I scored a lovely score on this scale of 48, which was quite high. So at lunchtime, they gave me some levodopa um, and um, I took that down in liquid form. And within an hour, I couldn't even walk, let alone get off the chair. I was completely frozen. So it's so all me in my funny way just said to him, well, I hope you got a bed for the night because we we're camping in the office. And uh, they wanted me to walk down the corridor. Well, as people know, I used Nordic walking poles. They were very concerned because they felt I was going to fall over in the hospital. And therefore, their, their insurance, I think, was going to kick in. So five months after that, I then got the final report, um, which basically says they're going to send me to a professor. So I've got another appointment, but that's in a year's time. So I'm waiting now for my professor to come to me and if not I'll have to chase it up but once again the, the care that people get is very very especially in the United Kingdom what I call postcode lottery so if you're living near a big university town or a big city there seems to be a reasonable amount of care but if you're in other areas in the UK the care is pretty poor and uh, we know of people have been waiting two years and so on so the idea of what Anthony's de developed and one of the reasons why I felt it was very important is that his technology can be delivered from anywhere in the world. And also it gives newly diagnosed people the opportunity to be diagnosed at a much more efficient and fast rate, and also at a financially reduced cost. Um, and so it can only improve people with Parkinson's. I'm gonna hand back to whoever Anthony wants to fire the question, but he is right. Sleep is extremely important to us all. Um, and so, um, you know, so this, this morning I had somebody contact me and uh, I'm going to see if I can get a smile out of her. And uh, they said, I can't get into the webinar. It's, uh, it's I've been trying for, since 9.30 this morning. And I thought, well, I can't video this. I can't video the person. I'm still in bed. And I thought, crikey, I'm sure I haven't missed it either. But we sorted that out. But as we know, sleep is a vital ingredient. So back to Anthony. Thank you for that, Richard. 
Um, before I move forward, I'm going to, um, there, there's a couple more demos I'd like to show and, and some really exciting news updates. Um, I do want to give this opportunity for a couple of people who joined the panel. Uh, my dear friend and advisor, Tan Rasab, as well as one of our junior AI engineers, uh, Gaukar. Um, Tan, would you like to introduce yourself and, and tell uh, what an impact you made on my life and, and for the team? Okay, so I think Tan might be a little held up right now and, and Garkar might be uh, snoozing in this morning. If, if you'd like to briefly share a bit about yourself, Garkar, and uh, who you are and what you're doing to the team. Um... Sure, thank you, Tani. Uh, basically, I joined Ageless AI uh, about four months ago in the beginning of summer. And I started like an intern and I was helping Tony to develop a chatbot for the dashboard so people would be able to orient who's in it and like we'll know all the capabilities of the dashboard and uh, now I'm helping Tony with different issues and different projects and I'm trying to um, put all my effort in it and try to benefit Asia's AI as much as possible. So I hope um, all my efforts <laughs> will be very uh, beneficial for the company. And uh, I hope it will work out perfectly in the future. I have so much belief in Tony and Tina and all the team. And I really hope guys that we'll, we're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thing is with our team, everyone is awfully humble. Um, Gakar is not trying, but she is doing. She is hitting the ground running. Um, she's got a master's degree in data science from uh, one of the leading universities in New York, Adelphi University. Um, when I used to live in New York, actually, my, my parents don't live too far from that university. I'd, I'd often study up there. And uh, I was really, really glad just to give you an idea, I posted a job up on LinkedIn and in 48 hours, I had over 800 applicants and the one person we chose was Gaukar. So she's a very, very sharp and bright individual uh, inc and incredibly eager, brings a lot of energy to the table and she learns ridiculously fast. So thank you for being a strong value add. Thank you for kind words. I really appreciate it. And let me know, Ten, are you there or are you back? Um, if not, you can say something in the chat. Okay. So now I'm gonna uh, with the with the previous you know demo uh, dashboard application I had just showcased um, that like we said, it's gonna be rolled out to clinicians. Uh, we're gonna be starting within the US healthcare uh, system and, and then expand globally. And we believe that this will bring a number of efficiencies uh, to the healthcare system. That way, um, neurologists and some of your own uh, specialists that look over you uh, will be able to accurately see where you are with trending analysis and as we continue developing uh, more, uh, we're, we're, we're excited to go to clinical trials, bring this to market and you know, impact millions of lives all over. So just some rough figures and statistics. Right now there's in the US, 1.2 million people suffering from Parkinson's. The economic impact through direct and indirect costs is over $50 billion a year. You know, what, what that means is that people like Jose, who's got to provide for his family, has to take sacrifices. 
people like my father might not be able to do his job for too long because of the condition. All this has trickled down effects. Now, luckily, my younger brother and I were working and we don't have to worry about that too much, but that's not the case for everyone, right? Jose's father, uh, Jose's son has Down syndrome and you might see him uh, walking across uh, in the living room. Part of the problem with Parkinson's and raising awareness is that to the eyes of the federal government and even global healthcare system, it's almost insignificant, right? So 1.2 million Americans out of 300, out of a population of 330 million comes down to less than 1% of the population. It's exactly 0.3%. The odds of someone running into some of Parkinson's is almost nearly impossible. So raising awareness is probably the first and foremost important thing, and it takes all of our efforts to do that. Now, when we look at the global picture, right now there's over 10 million people suffering from this condition. And I don't even wanna tally up what the economic costs are. It's probably unfathomable. And like I mentioned, this is the next pandemic in the waiting. It's the fastest growing brain disease in the world. Now I'm gonna show a demo of some of our newer developments. And I'll put this in the group chat as well. Then I'll explain uh, the significance of this. So this is one of our aliens that work for the team. No, I'm joking. He's not an alien. Uh, but he does display some green eyes. Um, Umer Hanif is also one of our senior AI engineers. Uh, he was working out of here in the Bay Area for Stanford uh, Sleep Lab as well. Uh, he recently returned back to Denmark also to complete his uh, PhD studies. So I'm just going to show you this awesome demo that uh, Richard has mentioned earlier. See the number of blinks here, it counts every time I blink, and then every five seconds, it also estimates the blinking frequency to the right. You can see that. And also, like, if I keep my eyes closed now, it's closed and then open. Um, so I just take, like, within that five-second interval, the number of blinks and just divide it by those, like, five seconds. Um, so if I try to not blink at all now, then it goes to zero, as you can see. And it's it's blinks per second, the, the unit of, like the measurement unit that I chose. Okay, okay. What um, happens if you blink really fast? <laughs> it works. Let's see, 1.8 1. 1. blinks per second. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. So I'm just gonna bring up another visual pictograph to help explain uh, what this technology is for. With some of the advancements uh, that's happening in artificial intelligence, we can now unlock new insights into the brain. So the eyes are not only the windows to the soul, but they're the windows to the brain. What Umer has just demoed out was the blinking frequency and the blinking duration rate. So that means how often the eyes open and close and keeping track of that. Now there's a number of things and data we can collect using artificial intelligence from these different properties and attributes and characteristics, we can then collect this information and apply further machine learning to unlock fascinating insights into the individual and the health of that person. We can not only find what age or gender they are, 
we may be able to see where they are located in the world, some of their identity, personality traits, if they're stress, the workload mentally, cognitive processes, which is important for us, the level of sleepiness, aptitude and skills, mental health, which is important for us, and an insight into different brain diseases, right? From Parkinson's to chronic pain, concussion, depression, PTSD, autism, eating disorders. So for our team and some of the technology that we're developing, we want to make a global impact of finding early detection of Parkinson's and other brain diseases. Now, this is not easy to pull off. Um, recently, some of you may have heard that um, a brand new program started out of Harvard uh, just last month. So the Wies Institute is one of the world's leading diagnostics labs that's attached to Harvard Medical. And I'm just gonna share a recent proposal that I've given to uh, the, the lead directors over there. And it was around this ocular analysis or eye analysis for early detection of brain diseases. So I mentioned to the directors that, again, there's not much innovation or insight or understanding when it comes to some of these brain diseases that we've outlined from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ADHD, autism, dementia, and so forth. In order to pull off something like this, it takes a wide contribution and development effort from some of the leading uh, hospital systems and, and clinical partners. So I've outlined to them, these are people, uh, these are labs and facilities and hospitals that we need to pull in to pull this off. Right. It takes a lot of data to really train the machine learning accurately. And at the end of this call, we'll, you know, uh, with Richard and Jose and Tina and some of our team members, we're going to talk about how we can pull in the international community, folks who have joined, to really make an impact globally together. So the industrial partners are Ageless AI. Um, I'm one of the co-leads, uh, Dr. Rushdie Ahmad, who's worked with Nobel Prize winners in the past. Uh, Dr. Trey Toombs is also one of the leading um, directors at Brigham and Women's, as well as Harvard Medical and, and the Wies Institute. So uh, the folks over at Harvard and MIT are 100% are behind our efforts, especially making impact in, in neuroscience neuroscience and bringing in more awareness and understanding. I'm just going to share some links in the group chat uh, for folks who want to learn more about the Wies Institute at Harvard. I'm also going to briefly share some uh, press releases. Give me one moment. Yeah, and folks, uh, just to give you an idea, this is a little bit different of a webinar format. Um, we're happy to bring people up on stage, up onto the panel. If there are specific questions you have, um, you may use a QA and a um, and then we can bring you up on board. Uh, we want to make this a two-way street and open dialogue. So uh, within the bottom of your um, Zoom panel, there is Q&A, questions and answers. Just drop a question in and, and you know, either myself or Tina will, will bring you up on stage and uh, we can hopefully answer some of your questions. So just last month, uh, the Wies Institute announced for the first time in history, the industrial participant program to accelerate the development of urgently needed diagnostics. Um, actually one of the other one of 17 participants is right here in, in the panel as well. My 
my good friend Tan and, and your advisor to Ageless AI as well. Um, he has started a fascinating and groundbreaking uh, genetics testing company. Uh, and his company is, you know, whole effort is to bring um, affordable point of care genetics testing um, to hospitals all over the world. So Tan is right here. He is the founder and CEO of Cygenex. Um, there are a number of other fascinating individuals who are part of this, um, as well as ourselves, um, Ageless AI. So the whole goal of this partnership and, and what the folks at this Institute are aiming to do is really change healthcare globally by making certain uh, technology and diagnostics accessible and affordable, not just within the US, but all over the world, including developing nations. I'm going to share this uh, press release for folks who, who are curious uh, in, in the chat. I will also uh, share the participants uh, in the chat. So I'm just going to take a moment of pause there. Um, if there's any questions or comments that um, maybe other panelists would like to bring up or anyone in the audience um, if you'd like to bring up or, or, or ask away, uh, by all means, I'm going to be looking at some of the chats coming in. Uh, maybe Helen or, or Tina, if you've seen something come in. So, um, oh, go ahead, Richard. No, it's okay. You go first because I'm. I've got a question for Anthony that he hasn't mentioned. Oh, so, please go ahead. Yeah. So one of the problems people have been well known of in the Parkinson's world is the development of technology that never actually gets through to a product. So one example I can always remember is something called the Emma watch, which was a watch wearable device that was developed in the UK, broadcast on BBC, and was designed for one person called Emma Lawton, who's quite famous in the community. But like so many other things that get developed, they just end up basically in the dustbin of, of sort of study. So what you've shown here today is bringing on other partners. And can you explain how you're going to make sure that we actually get a product at the end of it? Very good question. You're putting me on the spot, Mr. Rickety Warrior. Yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> hey, we want the tough questions, right? Um, thank you for bringing that up and absolutely very, very valid question. And I'm glad that I've, I've connected with Richard and this is one of the reasons why he's our board of director. And he can go on and on about companies he's seen in the past who's raised millions of dollars and have gone nowhere. Um, to his point, we've never, some of the technology that uh, or promising technology that he's seen has never been introduced into the real world. So I'm going to share uh, something briefly. And this is going back to um, this diagnostics accelerator that uh, Rushdi has outlined. So when it comes to making an impact and introducing technology, there are different facets in this timeline. And he's outlined it from discovery mode to the development phase, to the delivery efforts, and ultimately the impact that's wished to be achieved. So from the discovery efforts, you know, it's from patient advocacy groups like, like here today, we're all speaking with you here today. Uh, Jose and, and um, Richard are one of the leading voices out there. Discovery efforts also come from academia, from universities and various institutions, um, especially the needs from the clinicians themselves, physicians and specialists like neurologists from the hospital decision-making systems. Then there's the development efforts. How much funding is required to 
get something off the ground or technology uh, like we have off the ground that Ageless AI and, and other uh, promising companies are currently developing? Who needs to be pulled in from the nonprofits, from the foundations, the investors, the federal government, right? So when I say federal government, um, I'm talking at least from a U.S. standpoint. So NIH stands for National Institute of Health. NSF stands for National Science Foundation. DOD, Department of Defense, Air Force. Um, an interesting tidbit is that the Department of Defense, which is known for developing um, defense technologies or weapons technologies, have now opened up this massive funding budget for Parkinson's. DOD is funding more in Parkinson's research than the NIH is currently funding. So there are these different stakeholders that Rushdie's bringing to the table, that I'm bringing to the table. Um, even Tan Rasab, who's one of the panelists, he's got a lot of connections that he's bringing to the table. Uh, next week, I have, I'm speaking to some uh, directors from the Department of Defense. I've already spoken to people from the Navy and the Marines uh, and other uh, folks within the Department of Defense. Pretty soon we'll be in part of this AI ecosystem closely attached to the federal government. Actually, we're actually part of that right now. We're just going through the onboarding process. So, you know, we, we have been bootstrapped and we've developed things efficiently with the little capital that we've raised as we continue to raise more money through private investors and the federal government, this will quickly accelerate, um, finishing the product development and going to clinical trials. So right now I'm drafting out agreement with one of the leading hospitals in the country, Spalding Rehab. Spalding Rehabilitation is attached to Harvard Medical and they focus on stroke rehabilitation, spinal rehabilitation, Parkinson's chronic care management, dementia, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, ADHD, essential tremors, and, and so much more. Spalding will be one of our key clinical partners as we do further testing and validation as we complete our product. We now have access to the Harvard Labs. Uh, one of the most advanced research facilities for Parkinson's is at Harvard. I've connecting with I've already connected with uh, a neurological professor that teaches at Harvard Medical and that runs the Advanced Center for Parkinson's Research at Harvard. We also, um, people from across the water in Cambridge at MIT, um, I've already had numerous conversations with those directors, especially at Collins Lab. And the final phase is delivery making a product commercially readily available, putting things in front of the FDA, identifying who's going to pay for it. And in our case, um, Medicare will pay for it because people with Parkinson's, uh, Medicare covers over 90% of people with Parkinson's, at least within the US. You've got the NGOs, the World Health Organization, and finally, after it's introduced, what is the impact we, we, wish, to, we wish to achieve? Uh, underserved populations, developing countries that is in need of technology that's not available, and of course, the global community. Some of you have, may have heard or spoken to Kabugo Hannington, who's a good friend of Richard's. Kabugo is based in uh, Kampala, Uganda. He runs a Parkinson's clinic with about 75 individuals suffering from Parkinson's. He always runs into this issue of running out of medication, having inaccessibility of clinics. Just imagine if we have a problem out here in the States, just imagine in other parts of the country that are are not as fortunate. 
finding um, an active neurologist, a well-trained neurologist, someone who knows Parkinson's in, a, in and out, that can even dedicate the time, that can travel to various parts of Uganda is a huge challenge. We'll be able to solve this and make an impact throughout the world because of technology that can be set up remotely anywhere, just with internet. Then the next question might be, oh, well, what if some of these countries don't have access to internet? Um, some of you may be familiar with Elon Musk, the world's richest person right now. Uh, one of his private companies is SpaceX. I think right now they have over 70,000 satellites hovering the globe. We've set, we've purchased Starlink services for this community in Kampala, Uganda to set up high-speed internet access starting next year. That way, as we roll our technology, they have access to it. And first and foremost is educational material. This is something that is a big need and ask that has come out of the community. And we're providing educational material. So I'll take a pause there. I see Richard has stepped away. Um, and I'm going to pull up uh, William Brown up to the stage. Welcome, William. Would you like to answer your question live in, in front of us? Yeah, basically what it is, right? I'm 56. Uh, I've got Parkinson's disease. I've had it for about four years, but probably longer. The, the consultant record's probably about 15 years. Uh, and, and I've been having memory issues for, for, for about maybe a couple of years after diagnosis. And uh, April, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's dementia. Now, Parkinson's dementia is probably my most dominant symptom. Uh, I still shake, still got tremors, et cetera, but my, um, it's mere memory I've got uh, problems at the moment, uh, cloudiness, uh, bit stuttering, and actually thinking what I'm going to say. Have, sometimes I get the word to start uh, when I'm talking, things like that. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, say, Parkinson's dementia is not... It's a dementia, but it's different to other dementias. It doesn't seem to be as widely uh, underst as, as understood as other dementias. I'm just wondering, are you doing any research into into that kind of, into the actual Parkinson's dementia itself to make it widely uh, more widely understood and things that could do to be help patients with it? Uh, that's basically what I was why I say just why I say what you really know what you're if you're doing any research into this. Thank you for bringing this um, extremely urgent need up. Uh, quite frankly, William, um, at this current stages, we have a core focus on um, finishing up the UPDRS. So the UPDRS scale, we've automated over 80% of it. Um, one of those is identifying dementia. Or, or cognitive capabilities. At this point, we haven't developed around that focus area yet, uh, but it is on our, one of our long, uh, we have a laundry list of items to do. And this is up there and thank you for raising this. And I'm gonna be talking to my team to see what we can do. That said, we have some of the leading researchers, neuroscientists and engineers who are on this panel who are part of my team um, Sharina or Andreas, in your past, either at Stanford or University of Michigan, have, have you worked on or done any research related to dementia? Not so much, no. To some extent, regarding biomarkers in both molecules and in brain waves. Actually, my thesis lab is going into Parkinson's next. Uh, if you could elaborate more, um, it'd be very helpful for myself as well as William and Richard. The spotlight is yours. Yeah, when it comes to brain rhythms and neurological disorders, it seems that every neurological or psychiatric 
disorder. It has some sort of correlated problem in brain rhythms. So if we are working with MRIs, for instance, in any of our research or in other neuroimaging data sets, then we can potentially work with those as an early detection mechanism. Though the ocular tracking, it may have, well, faster applicability, and also it's a lot less invasive and more readily available to the typical person. Thank you, Sharina. Uh, you know, as we were mentioning the ocular analysis or the eye analysis using AI, there will be insights when it comes to dementia. Uh, when that, that means classical dementia as well as um, level of cognitive loss, even for people with Parkinson's and other brain diseases. Now we're just scratching the surface with uh, that development and research. Um, but William, um, we can always stay in touch, especially through Richard to see how we can uh, advance this urgent need. And well, if, you have any, if you have any further questions or comments, we're, we're all open ears. No, that'd be good. I'll, I'll keep in touch. Hey. Yeah, please do, William. Uh, keep in touch. Yeah, I will do, and, mate. Uh, yeah, because I can act out. Uh, I can act as the uh, communicator, me and Helen, back to Anthony. Yeah, because I think they like say Parkinson's dementia is such, it's, I'd say one of the lesser uh, conditions, uh, as you, as you probably, I don't know if you're aware of just the uh, uh, Parkinson's UK are doing a, a, an event in November to try and raise awareness for Parkinson's uh, dementia uh, through one of their uh, reports, etc. I've just uh, recently, wrote to my MP to get him to go because it needs more awareness raised because as you know Richard Parkinson's itself has got many other symptoms that go along with it and this one for me the, the dementia one is the most dominant one so this one is really urgent to try and see if we can get something done about it because yeah it's not very good as you know with your symptoms you've got the symptoms are all different for different people uh, so to, to make the sorry I'm going to start uh, So for the, the, the dementia side, it needs more research into it because it's dementia below the bodies as well. So it's all connected to Parkinson's. So that's, that's my main awareness campaign at the moment. That's what I'm involved in. So any help would be most grateful. Thank you very much. That's what we're here for, mate. We'll stay in touch. Thank you, William. Um, Richard, Helen, or Tina, uh, is there any other questions? I, I'm going through the chat currently. If, if there's something. Uh, I have something, Tony. So yeah. um, I've got most of the questions down that have been asked. Um, considering we're sort of talking about um, where our product might go, um, at least, you know, since we're, since you've, you've laid out what we're concentrating on, um, Ben is in the audience um, who we work with um, out of our, our co-working space in Sunnyvale. And he had, a well, he actually expressed interest in, yeah. He actually exp expressed he's, interest in talking in afterwards. Office. He's in the office today too. Um, about um, applying our technology to other movement disorders like my multiple scler sclerosis, um, which is definitely an offline um, discussion. Um, but I thought you might um, maybe just give a peek into what what our thoughts are around why it is we've chosen Parkinson's first and how our roadmap looks in the future and how we're sort of expanding and why we're concentrating in one place and where we would go after that. Thank you, Tina, and, and thank you, Ben. I'm, I'm waving over to Ben right now. <laughs> so uh, well, I'll come over to your desk and chat with you. Thank you for really, really, thank you for bringing this up. Ben is incredibly sharp when it comes to statistics. And tell Ben that I apologize. All I saw was Ben and I was like, hey, give us your phone number and you know, <laughs> contact us here and we'll talk to you later. I'm like, oh, that's Ben, I know Ben. <laughs> Yep, I saw Ben. I was like, hey, would you like to join this webinar? I said, sure thing. 
All right, any other questions or comments queued up? I'm, I'm going through the chat. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, bring you back right back to the beginning, Tony. Yeah. Um, and um, is to get um, Jose to basically um, go through what's coming up in his support groups. So the support group that he runs, um, he's got some very top ranking speakers coming in from nurses to people who have won gold medals at the Parkinson's table tennis to exercise teachers and to um, other people. So it's um, an opportunity for to sort of also promote Jose's group, which is absolutely fantastic, yeah, and gives a lot of care and support to people. Um, so I would like to, at the end of this, is to send out the details, if Jose is okay with that, to people who may not have been on his group for a while. Um, but uh, we've got some very um, top world experts um, coming on board to give some fantastic uh, presentations. And Jose is always very good because he manages to control me every Saturday, which is great. But his um, support group is one of the best going. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Let me pin Jose to this. Um, yes, we, we're definitely going to have to have a follow-up discussion um, in the next few days and um, see how we can keep getting more involved. Um, we did pay for this whole webinar format, so let's utilize as much as possible. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. And, and Jose, I, I hope you liked um, the format for today. I, I know it wasn't, um, you know, your normal format. And, you know, again, we, we want to have the security protocols in place, and we can always have this question Q&A format and bring individuals up on the panel, um, and they can, you know, uh, share their audio and video and, and, and ask questions live. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. What I like is um, it's too much about this problem, neurological problem that we had. Uh, we can know only one team fix the problem. So we need people working in different areas. People motivate people, technology people. I believe, I believe technology, I believe in medicine. Technology. Actually, I have a, a DBS, a, um, a deep brain stimulation in my, my brain for the last two years, which is technology You've been working away with me. Um, what I would like to add about uh, William talking about dementia and Parkinson, my understanding is I've been talking with people around the world with, with the disease and professional too. My understanding is the priority, the primary disease is Parkinson. And I don't know exactly how many cells it die every day. And now, so basically, we die in every day. Every day, people with Parkinson we are dying every day. Now, when when the doctor diagnoses you with Parkinson, you already lost forty percent of your cells. So, it depends how the cells start dying. When I so Parkinson, dementia, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, uh, epilepsy, uh, and other things that is associated with Parkinson. Because it's the, the mother of the neurological problem. Parkinson's disease has only 200, 200 years ago. Other diseases are new because the doctors are being classified in different groups to try to work together. But the, my point is that uh, thank you, Tony, because the, we are working on this. Thank you for all that they are running. Thank you for all that they are speaking. Thank you for those. That's my, my, my goal is bringing people out of the closet. So we have writers, we have painters, we have, we have a train, we have people that do boxing, we have many people with, with Parkinson do a lot of stuff, right? With people with Parkinson. So we wanna make sure that when people feel comfortable go a, a, a group, right? Instead of go, go to a doctor. So thank you, Tony, thank you. I know I, I, in the beginning I was kind of comfortable with the, with the former, right? Because it's totally different what I, what I do, but uh, I feel really comfortable, honestly. I feel really safe, comfortable. I understand the security protocol right around the world right now. It's kind of crazy with Facebook, Instagram, right? But uh, you know, definitely, I'm really, really if you're comfortable, and then yeah. So we need to still work in everybody. Everybody needs to be in their own area. So please, if if you don't know how to cook, don't try to cook, please. Because if you try, if you try to learn cooking with us, you're gonna miss that. Everything. So try to find out what is your spirit to give. 
So, and I believe that together we're going to find the cure. Maybe no, not going to be the cure, but we're going to be the way how our younger people, right? They're going to live more than us. And the idea is find out Parkinson before Parkinson be progress. That's the goal. So uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you. And really thank you everybody for, for what you guys are doing. And thank you for all the people also that show up to this meeting. And then uh, I always want to be open, you know, my, my group for you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be retired, so I start Monday, I have more time for this. Jose, thank you so much uh, for these words of praise. You know, uh, I've, I've, yeah. Well, I've got one more question. Absolutely. And then this is my last, I promise, yeah? Okay. Um, the other thing is, can you also talk to people a little bit about how the community can get involved with with ageless AI, yeah, going forward. Absolutely. Um, right now, I'm just going to readjust some of these pins. I'm gonna pin Tracy May, uh, our friend Massi from Italy. So, you know, obviously with uh, my relationship with my father, um, I've seen up close and personal how awful the disease is. And, you know, when it comes to a lot of innovative technologies, unfortunately, a lot of the development is not around the patient. And I've heard this throughout a number of areas, even in different verticals and um, focus areas for disorders or diseases and been in a number of chats and discussions. Um, and again, this is something that we stress at Ageless AI, having a patient-centric development. What that means is that we're putting you in the center of it all. And a lot of this will not be possible without placing the people's needs first. So with that said, as we continue to develop, uh, we've developed some of the core AI technology. There is still more technology that needs to be developed for uh, the mobile application. That's where we'll need everyone's help. There's gonna be more needs and requirements, especially for this early detection. We're gonna need your help. We're gonna you know, go through things in a very, serious process, having consent signs form uh, signed, especially if you know we ask to collect your data sets, right? So some of the research that each and every one of you and your communities can help uh, Ageless AI it out, um, especially you know if you wanna make a positive impact in the world um, with some of the technology that we demoed out earlier, right? This. AI analysis for the eyes and ocular analysis, it's a lot of work. Not only is it a lot of work, but there are challenges developing that. And one of the primary things um, that holds back amazing technology like AI impacting medicine is collecting and sourcing these data sets. So at some point, uh, once we're ready with the secure portal and we speak to our lawyers and we get some more advice from uh, Harvard and MIT. You know, we'll, we'll ask through Richard and through Jose how we can use the inter international community involved. There's gonna be different pillars, right? From early detection to continuing the development of the mobile application, the user experience to make sure that the needs are developed for you and for all of you. So I'll, I'll take a pause there if there's any further questions, either from Richard, Jose, and I'd like to say hi to Tracy, May, and, and Masi. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. If you wanna comment on that line or, or if you have questions, or if you just wanna say hi or thank you, by all means, uh, the floor is open. Hey, Tony, I, I would like to say, that uh, for uh, for us uh, is very important to to create a big relationship between 
medical uh, people and um, and people community our community because uh, also if there is not uh, if you are not free to ask it is uh, every question to our doctor and we we need to create we need to to, to break this barrier we need to create a new a new communi community new communication and also we need to uh, to to work together so we need to join together because uh, um, together we, we, we for, for for us it's very important that we have some people that you can call we can ask everything without no problem without to wait uh, too much time or without to wait uh, uh, so there is a is necessary to create a link a, a short link between the researcher between doctor between uh, uh, people that we need together we need to move in the same direction and it's important also to prescribe not, not only medicine but also a social activity so we need to create in the time that we waiting for the to find a new cure we need to create a new way to to, to, to ask the people to go outside to to have a social activity because uh, it's like a prison no? to stay at home in the past we feel like to to make a to, to one person to create a lot of uh, uh, to increase the disease if you ask to stay stay at home he will be become crazy so in the past when in the war to the people to the prisoner you put in the prison we have to go outside and so if the people remain in, inside the, the, the house inside the building become crazy so we need to go outside we need to move we need to have a social activity because we are human people and we need to have a relationship thanks a lot Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Messi, for bringing this up. Uh, you're absolutely, absolutely right. To pull something like this off, it takes everyone's voice. Uh, it takes a collaborative approach. And you need to line up multiple stakeholders, right? From the innovators like ourselves, to the patients that are impacted, to the clinicians, that are using the technology to the hospital decision makers and even more. It's not easy what we're doing. And when you voice your concerns and opinions and suggestions, we know we're heading down the right path. And you know Jose and Richard very well. So we're going to pull you in at the right time. And again, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And we'll make sure that we develop technology that is needed by you and for all the millions around the world. Thank you, Tony. I am, um, what I really like about your approach is that you put the individual, the person, the patient at the fore, um, that you, um, listen to what we have to say or you bring us in at, at a time when you need our information um, and that you um, don't shy away from this huge, huge, um, well, how do I call it, um, task that is ahead of you of bringing everybody together and uh, building a network that really works. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I, I believe that, that, you will, um, that you will bring the um, Parkinson's um, cure or support for people with Parkinson's into a new, into a new age, <laughs> up to a new level that, that we really need. So thank you. Thank you for coming up here. Uh, May, this really, really means a lot to me and my team. I know we've spoken a couple of times in the past and I really appreciate you joining from your corner of the world. I believe you're in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. And you put, Germany. <laughs> you put me in touch with either your cousin or your brother at one point. That was my brother, yes. <laughs> Um, and he's also a leading scientist in genetics. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
amazing, amazing individual. I recalled that conversation with him, I believe earlier in the summertime. So again, thank you so much for um, all the kind words you've mentioned. And I do need to circle back with your brother. Um, he's a he's a genius. <laughs> he's incredibly <laughs> sharp. <laughs> so um, I actually just, when I went to UK, I spoke to some of the leading genetics researchers over there at Oxford University. Um, they also want to enter into some sort of collaborative agreement um, or joint development using AI and, and genetics. Um, we have been, we, we've been, uh, I think several months ago, we are a qualified research partner with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and uh, we, have access to their uh, special portal with over 50,000 uh, data sets with people with Parkinson's and people without Parkinson's at a, a genetic data set level. And um, we have developed some algorithms around that analysis and, and we continue to uh, develop more algorithms regarding that. Uh, but again, May, thank you so much. Um, like I just mentioned to Masi, um, it takes a, international community to pull this off and um, with the people that you know from your brother to the other people that you know in Germany um, you know we'll organize with Tina Richard and Helen uh, when to uh, pull you in at the right time and place of uh, accelerating some of this urgent need and development so again thank you so much May thank you I welcome Tracy how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, it's lovely to hear from you all today. And um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm feeling a bit rough today, so I haven't really contributed much, but thank you to Richard for inviting me in. And um, it's, it's quite a new thing that I'm listening to today and quite encouraging to hear. Um, and I'm hoping that I can help you in the future, maybe. Um, as I say, it's all quite new to me, so I'm sure Richard will take a couple of hours to fill me in. <laughs> Um, but thank, thank you for letting me listen today. It's been, it's been my pleasure and great to hear from you all. Thank you. You're very welcome, Tracy. Um, like I mentioned, you, my father, May, Jose, Richard, and the folks who are listening on the call, there's over 10 million people suffering from this disease, and it's time we make a change, and it's time we make an impact. So, uh, I just want to thank you for joining. And we ask everyone here, panelists and attendees, to continue spreading the word and raising awareness one way or another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Take care. Tony, um, I, I apologize. I, I've got people showing up in my house any minute. So I was may have missed this. But um, did you answer Justin James's question about care management? Right. Hey, hey, Justin. Uh, Justin is one of my good friends. I've grown up with him back in New York. Um, Justin, I don't know if you're there. Uh, maybe you want to show your face or you can unmute yourself uh, at least and you can share this um, question and, and I can answer as best as I can. Yeah, uh, Tony, I'm here. Uh, just I'm actually holding a baby right now. I hope he doesn't scream. Um, but <clears throat> So I was wondering, um, you know, uh, with the development of, you know, the technology that you have right now, um, you know, this is mostly from what I can tell uh, for, you know, detection, prevention, um, that sort of thing. But is there anything um, in the works in terms of any kind of dedicated care management program where, um, you know, providers and patients can be uh, kind of, you know, linked together and, you know, therefore, you know, kind of develop that kind of personal coordination of care um, and also assist with disease management because we all know a uh, big part of it is, you know, actually managing uh, and assisting those that already have the condition. So I uh, just wanted to hear your feedback on that. Absolutely. So earlier this year, I filed a provisional patent uh, regarding this, uh, knowing the disease state where um, they are, where a person is individually and the patent I, I, uh, filed um, is, you know, one is part of this dashboard uh, for various clinical purposes. The other is the AI technology uh, involved. 
um, and the integration, right? The communication between all the different care partners, right? So there's a lot of, lot of work that needs to be done still. Some of the things that we've outlined and developed, um, you know, is maintaining a line of communication between um, the neurologist, movement disorder specialist, and the physical therapist, right? So let's say, um, remind me again, Justin, where you're working out of and, and what you're currently doing. Tony, can uh, I answer, can I, can I clarify yeah. something really quickly? Yeah. So actually, Justin, um, our, um, our technology does not do diagnostics necessarily. Um, uh, Parkinson's patients specifically, because we want to make sure that this is clear, um, still need a diagnosis directly from a doctor. Our technology will not replace that one-on-one -on -one face to face diagnostic or, or diagnosis. Um, it is meant to be a, a follow on technology or a follow on consistent um, care management tool, I think, if it, and I was reading up on this a little bit more because Tony and I've been trying to understand that it would be sort of that that link between the doctor, care team, and the patient in between visits with their doctor once they've been diagnosed. Um, the only question that I have, and this is where I want Tony to answer, would be if it's multi or sort of comorbidity focused, if it's multi disease or if it's just one disease focused. Is that what you're asking or is, did I already answer your question? And I know the baby might be. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't yeah. make sure in the background. But and we don't mind I, actually. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, that was, um, you know, that kind of answered my question uh, because my background is in, uh, I'm a nurse, but I do uh, care management right now. Okay. Um, so we do a lot of long-term follow-up with patients and, you know, you know, using apps and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I was just interested to see, you know, uh, on my end, you know, in my career, you know, I focus on follow-up and seeing clients, um, you know, after they've been diagnosed, but then, you know, the with the main focus of, you know, managing their care in the community. So I was just curious to see if you guys were exploring that path as well. Yeah. Um, you know, in fact, um, and I would love for Tony to sort of comment on it about the technology itself, or we'd be happy to have like, you know, a little more, um, deep dive with you. Um, I've been writing up things to, to help people understand a little bit better what we've been doing from a marketing perspective or to clarify. Um, my feeling is, and one of the things that we talk about um, with our investors and what we're trying to talk a little bit more about with this community, and maybe we need to have more of these more often, Tony, especially with folks like, like yourself. And I'd love to actually even reach out to um, the extended care community and to nurse and nurse practitioners and to the physicians themselves themselves to, to, to better understand what we're trying to do. And I think you definitely hit the nail on the head, which is, and Tony talks about this a lot, when we're seeing the, the clinical community decline, and especially after COVID with, with and I'm just going to use that as an example, when you have a clinical community that is exhausted, that is overburdened by the amount of patients and, and I'm just going to use some very simple simple terminology. When you've got more patients being created than you have doctors and care team members being created, um, you've just got you've just got a sort of a, a um, the changing ratio or just too many patients, not enough doctors, not enough care team members. So with our technology, the hope is is that we can unburden that situation. If doctors and the healthcare system can say, once you've got a diagnosis and the doctor and the care team or the, cl the clinic is comfortable and we can create programs, right? Which say, if all we need is a script, Medicare is going to cover it. The healthcare, the private healthcare system, the, you know, uh, country healthcare system, whatever that is, depending on where you are in the world is willing to help pay for that. We'll figure all of that out on the back end. You go home with a, with a prescription to download our software, to engage with our team. You would get a package in the mail or you would download the software and somewhere along the line, it would, it would you know, welcome you to Ageless AI. And we would have somebody give you a call or there would be some instructions that would say, you know, welcome to our, you know, welcome to the program. And it would lead you through steps 
Sharina has even talked about checklists. And then it would be a series of exercises um, at a certain um, um, at certain intervals, whether it's daily check-ins, whether it's a couple times a week or a couple times a month. And then instead of having to see your doctor or only getting to see your doctor a handful of times a year or to a certain you know number of minutes per year, whatever that is, um, uh, what is it, Richard? Like up to an hour or you know, at the most like four visits a year or something like that. Our technology cuts down well, it allows you to check in or we gather data about movement, different items on the UPDRS that we are checking in on regularly that shows trending data that allows for, and I, I wish I could read the document I wrote the other day that I spent hours on, but you know, it shows for that that mitigation of the health kit of the of the health of the patient along so many different lines. You know, are we seeing significant changes in their health? Do we do we see triggers where we could, you know, say, you know what, I'm seeing something I'm not liking. I'd love to see you in the office. And then you're not necessarily wor worrying so much about getting patients into the office to check on their health because you're seeing these trends similar to the way, and this is. This is, if anybody's familiar with diabetes and the way that we treat it now compared to how we treated it 20 years ago, it's very similar to that because you're seeing all of this wonderful information coming through the devices that are used. Now, I know that Parkinson's patients don't use a, a, you know, a home care device, but if we can use the cameras on your computers or the various things that we have to measure movement, um, facial expression, tremor analysis, we can really start to give that kind of all these data points to the doctors on a daily basis when you're having a good day, when you're having a bad day, and they get all of this information instead of just five, three, five, however many times you see them over the course of a year to give a lot more information. Hopefully they can treat you, give, give the patient a better quality of life better outcomes overall, as well as just better quality of care. The costs come down, everybody gets a much better idea of the disease itself. Doctors feel like they're unburdened and as well as the healthcare system overall, hopefully we're coming to a cure and better treatments. I know that was a long-winded answer, but I'm hoping and I'm learning as I go along that I'm able to answer some of those questions for you. I hope I did, did okay. Thank you. I think um, the baby's crying right now in Justin's arms. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah, it did answer my questions, but the baby is about to cry. So I'm gonna jump right off. Justin, thank you so much for joining. And Tina, I couldn't have said it better. Um, and, and this is a very, very good uh, point that you bring up. And, and for folks who are still on, on the Zoom call, um, you know, unfortunately, with the small team that we have, we haven't had the chance to develop, uh, you know, the primary tools and dashboards and you know, applications that someone like yourself uh, would need, right? Um, this is one of our also long list of uh, to do things uh, for nurses because they spend probably the most time with Parkinson's, whether it's uh, at home care or, or, you know, in the clinic. And, and Adam Fribbins, uh, who is the leading uh, nurse and expert care when it comes to Parkinson's, she's very closely connected to Richard and, and Jose as well. Um, and I've, I've also spoken to her a couple of times via email and, and Zoom calls. Um, and maybe we'll have her in, in about two weeks on another webinar and she can shed a lot more light. That said, uh, one of my friends is also on the panel over here, Joby. And I think Joby would find this fascinating that we've already started the development of a neurophysiotherapist dashboard. So we call this the NeuroPT dashboard. Um, this is one of our student physical therapists currently. Um, she's studying in upstate New York and she's been contributing um, from you know, her, her analysis and fundamental side, what a clinician would need um, to keep track or, or to look at from a high level and I've also, you know, uh, know this area quite a bit as well from physical therapy, from some of my own um, uh, recovery that I've done for, you know, 
um, ACL, torn ACLs and, and other stuff. So we've outlined some of these things for, you know, a clinician, like a neurophysiotherapist, right? Like if we put ourselves in the shoes of a clinician, what are some tools and software that can empower them, that can take their um, day-to-day job to the next level, uh, reduce the overhead, reduce, um, you know, their burnout and bring really efficiency to the overall system and to their uh, specific clinic. And overall, it's all about uh, increasing patient outcome, increasing someone's livelihood. So when it comes to physical therapy, uh, which is an interesting area, uh, because of human nature, um, people don't always do things as prescribed at home. Um, People love to get their hand held within the clinic, you know, within that hour, or two hours in the clinic with the physiotherapist. Um, they're walked through the exercises that needs to be done for optimal recovery. Then the physiotherapist will say, hey, go do these same exercises three or four days a week at home. And so our technology with some of the movement uh, analysis and AI analysis that we have, uh, that information can, will instantly get fed into the dashboard So that way, someone like Joby can have a quick, high-level analysis. He can look at all his patients all in one place, see who's on track, who's who's progressing, and who, if they need to call someone like Anthony Moose, who's clearly slacking and and behind. So uh, I just want to, you know, pass the mic over to Joby. Welcome, Joby. If you have any thoughts or comments uh, around this technology that I had just shared. Yeah, hey, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate um, the invitation. I just got it this morning, I saw. And honestly, um, I actually came across your whole company as a whole through someone else's like Instagram, social media. And then I saw it, and this is just when I was graduating. And I was just like mind blown from like what you were doing, how you did it with your dad. And it was just like really like um, impressive what how your technology is really like, I just, how it's going to really change like, the way things are working in the healthcare system, you know, that one-on-one care that you can really promote optimal care. And that's something that I'm really excited about, how we could also utilize that for, to really promote good health and good, um, for the patient as a whole. That's what, something I'm really like happy about. So thank you so much with that. And I'm excited to use this, hopefully in um, majority of the settings that I work in. So thank you so much. Anytime, Joby, it's been some time we've connected and uh, really, really, uh, I'm honored what you have to say and, and what, what you have to say to the company. It uh, seems like the word of mouth is out there and people are coming to know about Ageless AI one way or another. Um, you and I will definitely have to connect uh, probably this week to see how you know we can further uh, develop this dashboard and other uh, AI techniques for someone like yourself. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining this call, even though it was last minute. And, and who knows, there might be a spot on the team for you in the future. We, we need specialists as well. It doesn't just take engineers. We need the other half of the knowledge base. So nurses, clinicians, neurologists, uh, physicians, and, and especially physiotherapists. I think physiotherapists, nurses are probably most crucial when it comes to care of Parkinson's. And then as you, um, as the condition worsens, And I don't want to say worsens because that's the whole point of ageless AI, right? The name is ageless. The whole point is that through the techniques and tools that you clinicians have, you're empowered to slow down the condition. And hopefully, you know, as we understand more and we collect more data and the AI finds more insights, we can put a pause, maybe even reverse it, but that's, that's still a long ways out. But at the end of the day, we're, we're, you know, our mission statement is to improve the lives of people suffering from movement disorders and brain diseases like Parkinson's. In order to do that, it's, it's the clinicians. It's the clinicians that have to do that. And we're not, we're not taking away, you know, the jobs of the clinicians. We're, we're bringing you more powerful tools. So once again, thank you so much, Joby. Talk to you soon. I'll pass Tony. Yes. 
Uh, was wondering um, how much longer you anticipate us going. I, I think we're wrapping up now. If okay. there's anything people want to say, last comments or thanks or anything, we could bring you up on stage real quick, but we will be wrapping up in three or five minutes. I'm just going to pin a few people. Jose, I'm going to pin you right now. I'm going to pin Richard. Um, Rosie, welcome to the stage. Um, if there's anything you'd like to say, I don't know if we've connected in the past, maybe you could tell a bit about yourself and where you're calling in from. Maybe Rosie has left or might be a little camera shy. No, no worries. You can always drop things into a chat uh, or tell Richard or, or Jose. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Jose and then, and then Richard, and we'll be wrapping up. Just uh, two messages quickly. Uh, one is, um, as I say, uh, my goal is to work with people with Parkinson already after the diagnosis. My message is, now what? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? You got Parkinson. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Second, my second message for them is um, we are no sick people try to fight and be well. We are well people fighting a disease. We must stay together. So get out of the clothes, get out for the house, show your face, call me, messenger. We need to, we need to, we need to bring this. Don't forget for the people that already been diagnosed. Already. We need them. The data is in us. The, the data, the technologies, uh, doctor need is in us. We are, we, are, we are the data. So don't let them try to create and use it that you are not. So we are data. We, I think we, we learn more in this kind of group, right? Kind of webinar, right? With the doctor. So, anyway, anyways. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. I have to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Jose. We'll see you soon. Um, Rosie, I'll pass it over to you and then Richard. Thank you, Rosie, for joining. Hi. Sorry, is that Rosie and Josie sound very similar over bad internet connection? You can hear um, yeah, I'm, from, I'm from England. Um, I've had Parkinson's, was diagnosed with Parkinson's about six years ago. Um, I know Richard and Jose and several others on this call through uh, international Parkinson's community and social media. Um, I also know Hannington Kabugo in, in Kampala. Um, I was actually living in, in Uganda when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I didn't know him then. I've since linked up with him and um, I'm very involved and do quite a lot of support for him. So um, yeah, so that's, that's me really. Um, I'm enjoyed today. It's been very interesting. I look forward to hearing more. And hi to everybody I know. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, we'll definitely stay in touch. Our liaisons are mm. right here, Richard and, and Jose and Helen. Again, thank you so much for joining and learning more. And, and you know, we're going to have to use the whole community to spread the word and continue spreading the message. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll pass it over to Richard. Yeah, so um, no, I think this has been very good. And um, to, for the sort of the first time, I think since I've known Anthony and other things that he's shown me is that there is hope, not maybe for the cure, but there's hope for managed solutions to make people's lives better. And, um, and I think we've, that what Anthony's developing in his team is something special. So, and that's why I'm on board. And, uh, you know, and uh, Anthony, I'll give one word about Anthony. One is that he is a very caring type of person. And, um, and what he says he actually means, and I believe he will get done. Um, but if he doesn't get it done, I'm behind him to make sure he gets it done. Yeah. So, uh, so he's part of our family. So he's even stayed a night in my house. So there we are. So... But so, uh, yeah, thank you for all the people who have come along and uh, supported this event. And, and, and Rosie hasn't quite told you all. She does a lot of fundraising for Hannington. And she used to be a nurse in Uganda for many years. 
So I've known Rosie right from the start of my journey. And she's um, a pretty special person with May and Messi. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I, I wish I had more time in the UK so I could have spent a whole week over there uh, next time for sure. We'll do it. We'll, we'll box each other. And uh, if I don't do the work, you can punch me in the face. <laughs> All right, then um, we're going to draw this meeting to a close. I uh, just want to thank everyone, each and every one of you, the panelists, the organizers, Jose and Richard, uh, my chief operating officer, Tina, uh, my father, Johnson, um, the team members that have joined us here today from Sharina, Andreas, Gaukar, our advisor, Tan. Um, I had no idea this would be a nearly two and a half hour webinar. I thought it would be under an hour, um, but, and, and maybe next time we can have even a bigger, bigger turnout. So again, spread the word, it takes a lot of people to get this done. Um, and maybe we could schedule one in about two weeks and, and have a bigger audience and we'll, we'll publish a material and, and media uh, this coming week. What do you think, Tina? Absolutely, yeah. And, uh... Maybe we'll prepare a little bit of something more to share with everybody next time. We'll have that, that completed deck that 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 uh, talks a little bit better and we can play that ahead of time so that everyone's got a, a really good idea of what we are and who, you know, what we do. That'd be that'd be great. We can follow up with a, a few things and maybe we'll have a new website ready to share with everyone so that they can share that out with everyone too. We've got a lot of great things coming. Again, thank you all so, so, so much. I'll be closing the room in five, four, three,